Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. Joining me on the set of Shooting Blanks podcast today is none other than tier one operator, Donnan, a.k.a. Donnie. I know him as Afro Tactics One, and by the end of the show today, you're going to know him as Afro Tactics One on Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere else. He's in the studio. Give him a big round of applause. Welcome. Thanks, my dear. It's really good to be here. Yeah, you say that now. Everybody, <laughs> sa- everybody says that at the beginning. Let's see what you say an hour from now. Sure. Thank you for taking time to come in today. Sure. Thank- Th- I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me. Thank you for reaching out to the show and asking to be on. This gentleman scared me the first time I saw him on Instagram. He was modeling a cry precision battle shirt. Now, mind you, and I have to give his name or he'll get mad, Yancey Harrington, Arizona, forget the name of your company, operator, airborne, gave me that shirt because he bought it and he told me he was swimming in that shirt. He tried to sell it. Nobody would buy it. He sent me the shirt. I look like a a sausage in that shirt, like a sausage casing. And then what do I see three days later? I see you. <laughs> this shirt, perfect. Looks great on you. Well, you know, uh, Cry, it was, I have to tell you, it is tight. They they don't cut for bigger guys, you know. It's uh, I, I think it's more of like an athletic cut, but uh, I like them. I had the original Cry Feel shirt that when they first came out with, and I still wear it. Actually, it was in, um, it was in the, the camouflage and multicam pattern. Um, so I, I do like their stuff, but they are kind of pricey. They are, they are indeed pricey. And if you know, I found this out after seeing your, if you go on there and look, they do have big guy sizes. Right. But like you said, they taper down near right. the bottom where I need to hide my stuff. Right. You know, I'm shaped like a pear. I don't care. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but we do get older. Right. So that's what caught my eye. Then I started watching the videos. You are an instructor. A lot of people call themselves instructors, yeah. but to be able to teach adults, mm-hmm. And not just in a classroom, not just in a range, not just on this continent, right? But you've taught on every continent, haven't you? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Actually, yes, all the continents. See, I've done some homework on. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those, you know, that's my uh, part of my upbringing, and so called in the military upbringing. That's what we're going to talk about sure. next, Ben. I thought we were going to break a streak of Marines on the show. No, not going to happen, huh? No, because. Donnan. Yeah. Was first a Marine. Oh, all right. There we go. So it was. Keeping the trend alive. Yeah. And well, I mean, we were, we were really like, we're on like 700 people who, some of them we didn't even know had been Marines. Right. <laughs> we, get, we get halfway through an interview, and I'm going to push the, you know, the Army push. And they're right. like, oh, no, I was a Marine. Ah. Uh, then he got smart. <laughs> then he came, joined the Army. Not only joined the Army, he went where everybody wants to go. Selection in your selection group was 300 people at the start. Yeah, we had we had about three hundred and uh, ended up with like ninety seven, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, it sucked. <laughs> it, it did suck, but you went on to become a full flash green beret, full, full tab. Yeah, T- tell these guys what that means. Um, well, they call it the long tab, but basically, when you go through the special forces course, uh, when you graduate, you get the tab, which is a special forces on there. Now you have special forces units where you have other people that work in the group as support but the guys on the team or the a team is called will have all have the special forces tab above their airborne tab uh on their shoulders and if you weren't a married man at the time that happened it's true is it true and will you confirm for us that having that tab is like putting honey on your dick <laughs> well i was married i know you were married that's why i said had you not been married but could you could probably confirm from other people uh <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you never heard stories about that? Mm, no, not honey on the dick thing. But no, uh, <laughs> well, I, you know what I mean, making you no, attract, extra attractive to the opposite sex. No, I mean, not, you, you're talking about the seals. <laughs> oh, no, we don't talk about the seals because in our Christmas edition last year, right. when they gave me processed sugar, mm-hmm. and let me just go, <laughs> they just let me go, I said to them, I said, and if you're Navy SEAL, do me a favor and write a book about every fucking thing you do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've been living under death threats ever since. Right. No. So it's not – your story is not a unique one, mm-hmm. but your perspective on life is refreshing to me. 
Oh, you saw that video. You know I saw that video. <laughs> you did a video two years ago about being a conservative right. black man. Right. But there was a lot more in that video right. that was important to me, and mm-hmm. I think important. To, you know, we, you know, someone said I'm not a. We don't always talk about gear. We talk about gear, but I want to talk about the people behind it, mm-hmm. the people who use it, uh, the guns, the guys behind it, and the motivation behind it, and show a path to others that you can do that stuff too. All right. That normal folks can put in hard work and have a great result. You know, I say about myself. Born in obscurity to parents of modest means, mm-hmm. and I've had an incredible life. I've right. seen the world. Right. You were born Trinidad. That's right. Yeah. Emigrated to uh, United States, New York, for a bit, and ended up in uh, California. I think we lived in New York for about seven years, and ended up in uh, California for my teens. Until How did you I, not come away with a Brooklyn accent? It it was there. It was. It actually was kind of funny because when we. We moved to uh, California, all the, the kids around us, and they would say, you guys talk funny, you know, because we had the Brooklyn talk. You know, I had a friend named Daryl. Daryl. We, call, we called him Daryl, you know. Of course. course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it just went away. It just went away. So, but yeah, I mean, if I can, you know, a lot of people, like, you know, they come to you, how would you make it through Special Forces? And, you know, that's why I put out that story on uh, that video. And and I do and I I am going to suggest that when you're done listening to this show in its entirety, and watching it in its entirety on YouTube, that you jump over to his channel. And your channel is a little different. It's got your first name and your last it's name. It's my first and last name. It's it's that that's not anything to do with Afro tactics. Right. Just, but that's if you want to see right. that story, and it's yeah. worthwhile. If you've got young people in your house, yeah. young people that aren't decided about college, right. or a career in the trades, good place to sit up down. It's 25 minutes. Put them in front of the computer. Right. And suggest they watch, invite them to watch. My parents would have made me watch that yeah. had they seen that. Yeah. So you're in school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you and I would have been in the same grouping in high school. Mm-hmm. I graduated in 81. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. and as far as what was going to be next for you. Right. Um, well, um, high school was not real good for me. Um, but to tell the truth, I barely made it out. I said that. That's what I I'm saying. That. Yeah, I barely made it out of high school, and probably only one of the main reasons I stuck with it was that. Well, first off, my mom had to to sign me up for the military. Well, I signed up, but she had to sign because I was only 17, and I was 17 when I graduated high school. So she had to sign, uh, give the okay. And did you have to do the same thing I did? Because I was worried about my graduation process. I had to open that little thing and make sure there was a diploma in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because well, I wasn't sure. Well, my story was, I don't think it was in the videos, that uh, I had to go through summer school my last year and uh, because I was doing bad. Well, I was a regular, but, I was a regular in summer school. Yeah, and, and it, it's not because I was, I was bored in high school. That's my problem, all right, because it wasn't, I wasn't stupid or anything like that. I was just bored. I wanted to get out of there. So I did finish it and went to boot camp, MCRD San Diego. And you went quick, too. You graduated. I, yes. Uh, we graduated, I think it was on the 18th of June and the 19th, or I was the next morning I was in boot camp. And that's the smart way to do it because so many people today get in trouble. Right. Between Take the, the summer off. But yeah. Again, <laughs> yeah, oh, and then, you know, somebody introduces them to something they shouldn't be doing. Right. Yeah. And that messes up the whole career. Right. Exactly. So I, you I've literally you yeah. literally went within the 24 next hours. The next morning. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even go to the grad night celebration. I'm like, oh, I got to get up, man. Sorry. Bye. Did you have a point in your basic training? Because I know I did. Where I thought, I don't think my mother ever loved me <laughs> to sign this piece of paper. Well, I knew what I was getting into. I uh, thought I did. Yeah, my I, I had relatives that were in the Marine Corps prior, so and basically I was going to the recruiting office every you know every couple of days, just hanging out. You know, I just could not wait to get there. I mean, it was a it was an eye opener. It was a it was a it was a nut buster. Marine boot camp is no joke. It is no joke, especially back in the early 80s when I went. I mean, I'm sure the guys in the 70s are like laughing at us. Oh, yeah. But the further back you go, the the, the harder and tougher it was. Those guys were were sadistic, man. But I was okay with it. Yeah. And what was your first job skill in the Marines? I was um, – they actually put me to be an uh, electrician with the combat engineers. I wanted to be a grunt. I wanted to be 0311 – I wanted to be a recon man. That's what they called it. And they didn't offer it. Didn't offer infantry. I was I was upset. Right? So, you know, I graduated boot camp. 
did the little uh, recruiting duty, a little bit of recruiting duty. Oh, I didn't know you guys did that. Oh, yeah, it was great. In your neighborhood. Oh, how cool yeah, is that? Yeah, for a couple of months. And then I ended up going to Camp Lejeune and uh, going through the electrician school. You'll hear something funny. So That's Absolutely. <laughs> Our audience demands funny, don't so, you guys? So I got to to the school at uh, Courthouse Bay in Camp Lejeune, very famous place. I busted my ass. I graduated second in my class. Wow. And my only motivation was so I can get stationed back in California. So um, <laughs> so I got to choose El Toro, California. It's an air base. It's not there anymore. And I got to El Toro. I was there probably about two weeks. And then they say, hey, we need we need a couple privates to go to Okinawa, Japan. You just got here. You're leaving. <laughs> and for those of you who don't, don't know about the El, El Toro Air Base, right. uh, the Sears Automotive Department there, mm-hmm. do you remember that big Sears they had at the mall? I wasn't there long enough. <laughs> These mechanics were all probably uh, – they're all retired now, so they can't get in trouble. They all moonlight, moonlit from the Air Force and the oh, Marine Corps because yeah. they had to have that extra income. Right. Your car never got fixed faster yeah. and more polite. These guys literally bust their ass working at the Sears. Right. So you get to two weeks, California where yeah. you wanted to be in two weeks. They told me – did you even know where Okinawa was? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. And um, it, it's so funny. You know, I, I was like, what do you mean? I just got here. They're like, hey, we just need numbers. And you and uh, two other guys. As an electrician, though? Yes. Okay. So uh, they sent, they sent, you know, I saw us home basically about another extra month. It came down on orders. And, you know, it's so funny. Back in those days, uh, they had to charter the Freedom Bird. And if everyone had to travel in uniform. And, you know, you had your class ace. It was so uncomfortable. Flew to Japan, Okinawa, and that's – and, you know, that was a good thing for me. I mean, without it, I wouldn't have met my wife, you know, because I met her probably that following year. So I've been married that long, and that was 1982. Congratulations. That was 1982. So – Ben, how old were you – what were you doing in 1982? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea at all. <laughs> yeah, so – you know, it all, it all lined up, you know, for a reason. Um, I stayed an electrician. Um, I wasn't perfect, as you see in the video. I got in trouble, you know, and that's when I, le- I told you in the video, I said, hey, that's why I learned about personal responsibility and being responsible, you know, taking responsibility for, for your actions. And it's not just you alone. We've, yeah. we've all had, and when I was spending my time in Thailand, I right. loved Cobra Gold. Yeah. Uh. That big event where yes, all the I participated. So, but you know what the worst part for me was as a as a civilian contractor in that environment, mm-hmm. the behavior. Because yeah. I was the only American. A lot of those businesses knew year round, right? At the Utapau Air Base, Utapau. And, right. and then these guys come on leave, right? And I know that somebody lectured them before they came off that ship, right? I know they were, right? And then they would act up. Not everybody, you know. Oh God! But, but you know, you know how many seventeen-year-old kids I saw. Yeah. It's like keep walking because shore patrols could just yeah, get Patty, you. Right uh, I, I tell you, it's. Uh, I was in first group, so we were in Thailand quite a bit. And if you know, we'd have free time. We hear hey, the Navy's going to be in town. <laughs> we go. All right, we're going to Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we're not. We don't want to be anywhere near there, man. It's pretty. It was. It was just cra- chaos. And for those of you that are history buffs, Pattaya was uh, an R&R place during the Vietnam War. Utapau had the B-52 bombers there. It's the largest, if I'm not mistaken, concrete pour, reinforced concrete pour in the world where those B-52 bombers were based. It's a short hop down the road to the beach. Yep. You can walk in some of those bars today and still see original unit photographs right. of bombers, special forces folks. Right. It's like a museum. Someone right. needs to take all of Walking Street. Yeah. Yeah. Walking Street's a little different now. Oh, though. yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's a little different. A more, I was there last in 2000. Yeah, a lot more Russians and Koreans there. Oh, yeah. And some Chinese. But but there's some of the, the, the ambiance is still there. You know, a lot of the older bars is yeah. there, still there. You see some of the pictures, yeah. They'll call it goats. Goats. <laughs> That's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, those of yeah. you that love those cute little baby oh, goats you bastards. see at the fair in the petting zoo, <laughs> uh, we did not hurt any of those. These were evil goats. They don't. They don't feel anything.